everybody. Welcome to Rocket Lasso Live. I'm Chris Schmidt, and we are here to take questions about motion graphics and Cinema 4D and just cool stuff in uh, in 3D and 3D animation. So we are ready to go. We've already got people in the chat room already asking questions. We got lots of people. I already said some hellos. Um, so let's go and start checking out some links or some questions. First of all, I want to address somebody. Uh, I missed the question somewhere earlier, but somebody was saying, what about the Game of Thrones building on animation? Not sure how to tackle it. Uh, that is just a huge undertaking. I'm sure there's a big old studio that spent a lot of time building that stuff and rigging it and whatnot. There's no like, hey, throw it in the cloner and do this technique thing. That's just a lot of manual animation. Every single tower building on the tree, everything is a unique rig that would have to be built. Not exactly something we can tackle easily and ex especially not in the live stream. Uh, J-Man has a link. Uh, it goes to Instagram. So let's go ahead and click on that one and share the screen here. Let's see, what do we got? Um, I got to be careful about uh, audio playing in here. I don't know when the audio is playing through really loud. But uh, what do we got? We've got something from Bridge and FX or Bridge and FX. Um, so we got like these little cup shapes traveling around inside of a sphere. They're pretty, they're pretty neat looking. And then we got like kind of this really shallow depth of field. Um, the uh, jerky way that everything's moving around is really fun. I, there's, I think there's actually something that we can extract from here. Um, like this is supposed to be another rapid fire episode, so we're not going to be spending too long on any one thing. But let's see if we can't get something somewhat along these lines. So um, why don't we go ahead and make a shape of some sort here. I'm going to make a... Um, I'm trying to think of something we do a little different. I mean, they have a sphere. A sphere would be easiest, but I think maybe we'll just make it two-dimensional. In fact, instead of a plane, why don't we make it a cube? So this is going to be a surface, and things are going to be traveling around on the top part of the surface. I'm going to go ahead and make this way bigger, 2,000 by 2,000, still only 200 tall. And now I'm going to make a second cube, and let's see, a couple details. How should we do this? Yeah, okay, uh, we're going to make a cube, and we're going to make it dynamic. So we're going to add a, a couple things, actually. Why don't we make a floor? And the floor is at 0, 0, 0, and that's fine. And we're going to temporarily turn off this box, and then we've got our one cube here that's going to be sitting there. So let's go ahead and make the floor dynamic and this cube dynamic. Select both of them, right-click, simulation, rigid body. So now that should fall to the floor and just kind of sit there. Good start. Let's go ahead and grab both of those and we're going to give it no bounce and no friction so it can kind of freely slide around on it. So now that that is happening, we could go ahead and probably trap it inside a smaller area of some sort. Um, not necessarily necessary, but let's go ahead and uh, create another cube. T for scaling, a scale it pretty big, something like that. Let's go ahead and right click and add a Cinema 4D display tag. And let's say use, and I'm gonna change it to line. So now you can see we've got this invis invisible cage. And I think it's really important. You could just visually hide it, be like, that's about this at that size. But I've often done those types of rigs and then something will be happening dynamically. I'm like, why is that happening? Because there's no visual indication of what was happening and it really throws me off. In that case, we're gonna steal this collider tag off of the floor, the floor specifically, because I already turned off the dynamic state. And we're going to go to collision and we're gonna change the shape to static mesh so it can actually see the inside of the cube. So now the idea is if we make a simulate uh, particles turbulence modifier, then uh, this, this should be blowing our object around a little bit. Now it's a pretty weak right now and there's no scale. So let's give it some scale. Let's just jump this up to 55. And as soon as we do that, we can see our cube is starting to slide around a little bit. We're gonna need a lot more frames and we can go and see our cube and it should be sliding around kind of freely moving. Now we could go and maybe increase our noise here a little bit so that yeah, they're gonna, it's gonna travel around a little bit more. Now let's go ahead and make a MoGraph cloner. And this cloner, we're going to put the cube and let's, oops, wrong cube. Let's go ahead and rename this one walls. Let's go ahead and rename this one bounce or I guess it's more appropriate to do slide. So that's gonna be a sliding cube. Put this in the cloner. I'm gonna set this to a honeycomb array and let's lay that flat on the ground. 
and let's go ahead and decrease our count a little bit until we're fitting inside. There we go. Um, and maybe space them out a little bit more because next step is to scoot everything up into the air a little bit and we're going to add some variation in the scale. So let's create a random effector. The random effector is moving the position. That really doesn't matter. I guess I can change your initial state, but let's go ahead and grab scale. Um, I'm gonna say uniform scale and let's go ahead and scale both up and down so we get different size cubes all over the place. If we go ahead and hit play, then they should all hit the ground and start sliding around. So already working pretty well. Um, I like the way that looks. Now, stylistically, I think something that might be fun is if we made it so that these weren't turning and rotating. So let's go ahead into our dynamics tag on our slide cube, and I'm going to go into forces, and I'm gonna say the, uh, I'm gonna change the follow rotation to, let's say 15. You can do really big numbers, but that can start getting a little crazy. They are rotating a little bit. Let's jump out to 55, so that should be pretty harsh. I'm also going to go to our angular dampening and set it to, let's say 100%. Actually, here's a little test I want to do. If we set angular dampening to 100%, um, can they rotate? And from the top view, yes, they can slowly rotate. Can we go above 100%? Yeah, we can. But I'm just curious if this is going to stop them from being able to kind of rotating at all. And I, I still think we get a little bit of rotation in there. So anyway, we can go and crank up a whole bunch of follow rotation. Our angular dampening should just kind of stop them from being able to do a big rotation on the uh, outset. But it might also stop them from returning. So I'm actually a little reluctant to do that. Um, now, uh, let's go ahead and crank this up crazy high just because I want to see if it gets twitchy. So now we're, okay, 100 is apparently the max on there. But you can see they do a little bit of rotation, but uh, I'm just going to, like, that's good enough. They're going to be sliding around and doing their own thing here. Uh, I like that. Now, they are bumping into each other directly, which is potentially fine, but we need at least a little bit of space in between them. So let's go ahead and grab our dynamics tag, go to... Uh, use a margin and let's go ahead and put in a fairly large margin so we can guarantee we're seeing something so now the hope will be let's look at this perfectly from the top that margin is not doing anything so maybe it's size increment so i'm going to change this to 25 there we go size increment not margin i always mix those two up so now that there's a, a size increment to 25 you can see they can't quite touch each other there has to be at least 25 units between them potentially there's 25 units on one and 25 units on the next one so they're 50 units apart but visually i just didn't want them quite to touch each other so that already is working well quite happy with that um so with this all sliding around what would be the next thing well um well first of all i mean if we didn't want any rotation here um potentially there would be a way of doing that um my idea there and this might be worth it let's go ahead and spend a little bit of time because i think we're getting some good details here um i'm gonna go ahead and make a cloner two and this one i'm going to tell it that it's not dynamic and in fact, why don't we go and hide this first one? So actually, I didn't hide it. I just dragged this this uh, other shape. So you can see it's actually um, just making it a, a wireframe. So now we can look at our second set. And I'm going to tell this I want it to clone. Actually, we don't No, We do need the random effect. Otherwise, they're not going to be scaled up and down. But I'm going to tell it that I want it to be cloning onto an object. And the object is going to be this cloner. And the cloner right now is cloning onto the surfaces of the other one. But I can tell it to not be uh, viewing the surface or the geometry at all. I can just say I care about the axis of the object. So now the axis of the object is what we're cloning onto. And the hope is if I have play, um, unfortunately not. I was hoping that these would follow wherever those go, but they are not. And oop, if I turn off, oh, that's weird. Do you see when I refresh something, it actually did jump into position? That's uh, weird and a little frustrating because it almost seems like it should be working. It just isn't actively. If I turn it off and on, it does. Um, if it doesn't want to work, I don't know of anything we do to fix it. it would be like We can't throw it into a connect object because we need it to be acknowledging those as individual clones. The only thing I can think of that might be like an intermediary here would be if we... I'm actually going to do... Here's a neat trick. If, you copy, if I copy and paste that one, I can click on... Um, MoGraph swap cloner matrix. And now that turned that into a uh, matrix object. And now that matrix object is going to be cloning onto an object and the object is going to be our cloner and that's going to be on the axis. And now the hope is, let's go ahead and turn off this cloner temporarily. The hope would be that this matrix object, well, that's bizarre. 
Uh, I might have done something. What did I do wrong? Because my initial clone. Oh, why did this get set to object mode? Huh. Did I click something in the wrong order? Or copy and paste the wrong one? It looks like I messed up my hierarchy. Ap apologies for that. Um, we should be able to rebuild it by dropping that out of there. Now, oh yeah, Cloner 2 got on the bottom somehow. I don't know how, oh, I'm, I know what happened. Sorry, apologies. I moved one cloner below the other to see if there's an order of operations, but I didn't remember I did that, so I just kind of interchangeably swapped one to the other. So this one is supposed to be the invisible one. This one is not supposed to be dynamic. And now I want this cloner to be cloning onto this one. And now all I want to see is if this matrix object is sticking to it. And you can see actually that this matrix object is sticking to it. So now that that is properly sticking, I'm going to tell this cloner to clone not onto itself, but onto an object. And the object is going to be that matrix object. And now it, it's, there's a little bit redundant and it seems like we're getting a single frame of weird refresh. But in any case, we did successfully copy one copy over. But the reason for doing all of those extra steps there is I can go and grab my second cloner here and say, and I already have a line clone turned off, which means even though these other ones are rotating a little bit, our next set, this final one that we're actually going to see render, that one is not um, rotating at all. And since we have that margin, I feel like that we've got a little wiggle room. That was real specific. We probably didn't need to worry about it too much, but there we go. Uh, another important detail I forgot to mention, uh, when we built this wall that we're bouncing off of, uh, we should tell it right away not to be able to render because otherwise we'll see it render there. So let's make sure we can turn that off. Now we've got this. Let's go ahead and turn on an SSAO and that's so that we can see this stuff actually landing on the ground, although it's really small. If you want, you can actually change the settings on the SSAO. If I hit uh, Alt-V, and click on my viewport here. You want to click specifically on this viewport so it knows which one we're on. We can click on Open GL and tab, uh, tab open the SSAO. And now we've got things like radius and I can increase the radius and I can increase our power. So it becomes a little bit more intense and we can see we get that little bit of natural ambient occlusion going um, and things like depth range and whatnot. So um, now we can just see a little bit of separation in the viewport. It doesn't do too much and you know, it's as powerful as you want it to be. So now we've got all these sliding around. That's working really well. I'm quite pleased with that. Let's go ahead and give this a quick save because we haven't done that yet. Episode 7, Scene Files. And let's go ahead and give this a quick save to um, Sliding Cubes, I guess, works. 1A Sliding Cubes. Um, okay, cool. And... Uh, keep in mind when I save any scene files, if you're a member on Patreon at the engineer level, then you get all the scene files at the uh, end of the episode. But in any case, we've got this playing and sliding around, all working really well. Now let's go and reintroduce this original cube we made back into it. And we got the floor. I don't actually want to see the floor either. I'm going to make that completely invisible. Now, if we can get this working, and that's a big if, uh, I'm going to make a R20 volume builder. And we're going to drop in this kind of uh, floor box. You see it's going to turn into a big old fat voxel. Now, this is a pretty big scene, so I'm going to actually increase the size of our voxels. That's probably too much. Let's try 25. And uh, now I'm also going to drag in our cloned cubes in. And now you will see that we've got a slight problem where only that first one is getting cloned in. Um, we can try a couple things. First of all, let's see if we can drag it in this way. Nope, looks like still only the first one is being dragged in. Let's go ahead and grab this entire thing and put it into a connect object. And we don't have to weld, so we'll turn that off. And let's try putting, I'm gonna remove the one I dragged in, and let's try putting that as an entire child. And it seems to not like that either. Uh, I have gotten this working before, but it's a pain. Uh, use mesh points, no. What is it that I've done to make it see a cloner like that? Um, render instances. Oh, let's go to regular instances. That might actually single-handedly have been the problem. Yeah, okay, that was single-handedly the problem. I was doing render instances, and I should have just been on regular instance. But in any case, we can now see that we have our cubes, and they're sliding around uh, on here. Now, obviously, we don't want them being a union, we want them subtracting. There we go. So now we're taking this big bite out of it as it's traveling around. So we need a better resolution. So let's drop this back down to 10. So, you know, I guess it's a lot, but it's not necessarily too much. And now we hit play. We're going to see these sliding around, each of their individual shapes doing their own thing. 
and that's actually working pretty well. The um, actually something that's interesting is I would kind of like the different heights. Like if a bigger if a cube is bigger, I'd like it to go deeper. But gravity is pulling everything down. So if I want to emulate that effect, what I would actually do is grab our floor and flip our. This is gonna be weird. I'm gonna flip our floor upside down, 180 degrees, and I'm gonna pull our floor up into the air. Let's go ahead and make it visible for a second. So now you can see it's up here. Now what I actually would like to do is move it so that these are probably pretty low, like that. So something like that. And it might not be quite low enough, but I'm going to hit Control D, and let's go to our dynamic settings, Controller Command D, dynamic settings. We've got our gravity. I'm going to say negative gravity. So gravity is pushing up, so it should fall up onto that floor. And just so we can see things clearly, let's turn off the Ronoi fracture and let that hit play. Um, whoa. What is going on there? All right, let's give this a quick second. I'm going to turn off all that. We don't need to worry about it. Why are those falling down? Is it intersecting the floor? Oh, 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 oh. It might be intersecting. Yeah, it's intersecting the floor at the time of creation. I was already animating. So, yeah, I don't want to move that up a little bit like that so it's not intersecting any of them. And now they won't shoot down. My fault. And now they can fall up onto the floor. So we have different size cubes in theory. Did um, our effect, oh, I turned off our effector at some point. Also, my mistake. Okay, that effector is turned back on again. Once again, our floor may be intersecting. It is slightly. Just pop that up there. All righty. Now, that should be working. So now, we can go and check out our final cubes and hit play. And you see they're going to fall up into the ceiling. So they actually all should be, um, hmm, interesting. Double interesting. Oh, okay. Look, here's an another detail I did not know. When, um, let me talk through it for what I just realized. We had a random effector, and the random effector was affecting all of our cloners and our matrix object. And what the cloner was doing is shrinking some of these cubes down. But then this one, I thought we also had the, had the, to have the random vector in it, but it was taking it and shrinking them down even more. And then our cloner was cloning onto that and because this is referencing our first one, it was taking on the attributes of the first cloner and then doubling the effect with the, ra the random vector. And then we are applying the effect again when we cloned our cloner onto the effect, onto the, uh, the matrix object. And then it was shrinking even more. So you see every time it was shrinking it or making it bigger on every single one. We actually didn't need that. All the scaling is coming in naturally from that very first one. So we don't have to worry about those parts. So there we go. Now they are all, they are all falling up into the ceiling. So now you see we get our different height variations. And now that we're getting that, we can go and grab our original cube, scoot it up enough so it's actually touching all of them. We want them touching at least a little bit on every single one. But now when we turn on our volume, they're going to be taking the bites out. And I'm actually going to hide this one now because I don't need to see it. Um, let's let these, uh, figure themselves out for the initial little bit. It's kind of weird where some of them weren't appearing right away, but now you can see some of these pits are going very deep and some of them are very shallow and now everything should be sliding around correctly moving and, uh, yeah, it's working quite well. Uh, I am slightly worried that the floor is intersecting again. No, it's not. I'm not sure why it did that. Uh, some of them are still falling away. That is bizarre like we are definitely below it but some fell away and then had to move up that's not the way i would think gravity would work i mean gravity's just turned on to negative 1000 so they shouldn't start naturally falling down um i'm going to ignore for now because i want to get to more questions but um anyway the point being is now we've got this nice cube we've got all these cubes floating around inside of it let's go ahead and give this a quick save as number b and yeah, then of course we take our volume builder and we throw that into a volume mesher. And then bloop, we get our final geometry or something akin to some final geometry. We see we get some nice rounding on here. We have a lot of options with our cubes. Like we could grab these cubes and stylistically, if we wanted, we can go and put a fillet on them. It's gonna round them out quite a bit. We could also uh, not put the fillet on there and we could inside of our volume builder do something like create a smoothing layer. And this is going to smooth that out quite a bit. Um, and it's too much, so let's go ahead and pull it back significantly, but we get a little bit of rounding on there, take those edges off. Um, and potentially we could be cloning additional things, additional details. Um, I guess a fun detail might be, hmm, the way it's moving up and down, I don't know if that would work too well. 
Um, um, yeah, that, I mean, there's a lot of different uh, things we could do, too. I can copy this entire cloner, and this, the secondary cloner, I could just grab these cubes and say, you know what, I want some smaller cubes, and those are going to be the inverse of what we had, and we could even tell these to be rounded, so we can round those out. So now you can see that we have one shape being added, the other shape being removed, and now we've got these little you know, these little indentations moving around and they should all go and be traveling exactly where our dynamics is telling them to travel. Um, and they just kind of float there in the air and they will take out this bite and, uh, they're dynamic. So these will actually, as one shape gets near another one, it should, let's see, that one's moving the quickest, but it should hit and kind of bounce off of it. Uh, in theory, actually, we could put some bounce back into our dynamics. This is running quite slowly, obviously, because we're doing a lot of volume things but if i were to turn that off we should see these moving very very quickly and we could make sure that um we could make sure that the uh oh we're I'm not make sure we can make them bouncy we can go and grab this cloner which is the only dynamics that are really doing anything i could add a bunch of bounce on there let's do 99 percent bounce so now it's a hit each other yeah actually it's kind of fun like bing 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 and then we didn't, don't need them to have quite as much of a margin around if we don't want to. So I can set that down to 10. So now they can get pretty close to each other. Not quite touch, but pretty close to each other. Uh, I'm going to set the gravity up higher because I just don't know why it's uh, doing that. And it shouldn't affect anything else. It should just have the gravity affect them quicker. Um, something that's actually a little bit strange is I feel like we're still seeing a little bit of rotation in here. And I didn't think we would see that. Now we might be able to just override that. I'm going to grab... Actually, let's grab the... Uh, I'm going to tell this not to align the clone on the matrix object. Does that scale? Ooh, align clone seems to stop it from scaling. Um, but in any case, if I were to grab both of the cloners and add a MoGraph plane effector, this might or might not work. I don't want to affect the position, but I do want to affect the rotation. I'm going to set the rotation to 0, 0, 0. And I'm going to say I want it to be an absolute rotation. Uh, so now this should be, in theory, forcing them to not rotate. I'm, have, I'm looking. I'm not seeing any rotation. I don't guarantee it, but I think that there isn't any rotation. So, yeah, after the first couple frames, you'd want to ignore the first few. But I really love the way these are, like, bouncing around now. It's really fun. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give this a quick save. Let's go ahead and turn these on. And, yeah, you can see our final shapes. I think I'd probably want to maybe even scoot this big old cube up a little bit more just so we get that intersection on these small ones. So the deep ones can go deep, the shallow ones can go shallow. Um, you can see the radius here is big enough where they're actually, some of them can blob into each other. So once again, that just goes in stylistically into our margin. If we set our margin up to 15, that might be enough to keep them from intersecting. And right there, not quite, but once again, that's all, also a push and pull we have with our voxel size. If we make our voxel size half the size, it's going to sharpen everything up a lot. And then even where those were colliding, it would probably clean them up. So, yeah, now we end up with this. Of course, you got a crazy high poly count. In an example like this, there's a good chance that we could add some adaptive uh, range in there, and it can actually create a lot fewer polygons. Uh, and it, just by ticking up one, all these big flat areas will dramatically decrease our poly count. It's not actually going to speed you up. Um, in the viewport because it's still doing all the calculations. In fact, I think it's having to do more calculations to do a cleanup algorithm. Um, so it might actually play back slower, but you have a lot fewer polygons in the scene, which depending on the way you're rendering might make a difference or not. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that is pretty fun. Uh, keep in mind that the smooth layer is a, a hog, so that's going to probably be slowing us down significantly. Like That's like half of our frame rate, the smoothing layer. So using that one sparingly is a good idea. And uh, yeah, we've got all these bouncing around, and the dynamics and physics are really fun, especially when we turn this off and we can actually see them bouncing around. Bing, 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 bing. So this at speed, I think, would actually be pretty fun, and just based on a, a single turbulence, all the animation being driven just by turbulence. So pretty fun. Um, all right, I want to do more questions. That one was fun. I felt like there's a lot of good, good information, but I did want to jump around. So we're going to be jumping in. Uh, if I didn't, uh, there's been a lot of chat, so feel free to repost your question if you didn't. But right now I can see a couple people chatting down here. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, for everybody in the chat, I mean, I checked the chat, especially when I'm having some sort of a problem, but was there a technical problem? What was that? I mean, it's, people might have had an answer to me that when I rearranged them by accident and I didn't notice it right away. 
Um, so, um, do, 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 uh, level bevel is, um, what are you saying? Not your typical question. It'd be fun to watch you try and tackle a functional rocket lasso with spine dynamics. Uh, we, in the in episode zero, when we were kind of talking through the show, I think we tried to make a lasso, and cinema was was not cooperating. So it's not it's not something I'm going to tackle right now because I feel like it, it's a very technical specific question. So it makes it so I'd be spending a lot of time on it. It's a fun idea, and I would like to do some more of it. In fact, I was doing some. I'm trying to do some more pixel animation. Um, stuff which i've been having a lot of fun with so i was working on this uh pixelated or i've, I've got the rock i've got the rocket traveling i was literally doing this before the stream and i'm rendering it out at a really low resolution and this is not ready yet but you can see here that it renders really quick and you go and view to view it at like 800 percent and then i hit play and i'm getting these really fun like pixelated things but uh, all the backgrounds are everything it's not working quite yet so this is just like in progress but i was going to be doing a couple fun little things there um so yeah i'm definitely got some more rocket stuff going um do, do, do. guitar boy is linking to a gif um so let's see what we got oh noodle extrusion um, interesting. Um, I feel like, um, and this is probably from one of those, like, how it gets made, like, factory type of things. I like how it's just like a little blade that spins around. Cut, 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 cut. Uh, yeah, I think we might be able to tackle something like this. Um, now, we are going to be faking it. Um, we're not going to do this for real because I can't. Like how, like, because there's essentially you're, you're pushing like a fluid, a really stiff fluid through there. And we are not going to do anything like that. It would be insane. But the idea of some sort of extrusion, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, the idea of some sort of extrusion here, I think that would actually work pretty well. Uh, thanks for all the questions, everybody. We're getting tons of them in the chat. It's, it is absolutely awesome. Um, let's go ahead and make a smallish noodle. And let's go ahead and double the rotations. That seems about right. And then um, how would those noodles actually look? I guess it travels. Is it two? It might be two opposing helixes. So we take this one and hit R for rotate, spin a little bit. We want to spin this one 180. And then we've got two different spirals. Um, and then we don't we don't loft between them. I think we loft, let's see, I'm gonna grab these and put them in loft. I don't think it will work. Oh, actually that does work. Okay, I didn't think it would work, but it does, cool. I thought, and maybe it'd be a way of doing a different type of noodle, but I thought we'd have to take one and put the radius down to zero like that, and now do this kind of spiral. So it's kind of like two different things, but honestly, it's just kind of the same idea, just spinning twice. Um, now it does spin double what I thought it would. So, or maybe, actually, you know, maybe maybe shrinking the radius. No, wait, I accidentally only returned on one. There we go. Um, that, that seems to work. I think we're just spinning around too many times now. So let's cut that back in half. Uh, I guess another 360 would probably be good. So yeah, there we go. It's about, about a noodle there. Uh, we can go to our loft shape here. Let's get this as low poly but clean as we can. So more segments around there would be good. But we don't need all those extra subdivisions in between. And now we get this nice helix going. That's looking pretty good. This is, by the way, one of my favorite types of noodle. Uh, okay, so we got that going. And ultimately, we're going to want this to have some thickness. So we would go and if we're going to do it kind of parametrically, we can go put this on the cloth surface. Of course, it's traditionally a way of doing it. Don't subdivide here, but add on some thickness like that. And um, kind of interestingly, every other one is spinning up and or down. So it pinches in or out, which actually is logical, but a problem. That's a surprising problem, but it's a problem nonetheless. If we were to make this editable, uh, letter C, editable, and select our polygons, you'll actually see that every other ring faces the other direction because we're actually seeing the underside as they loop from one side to the other. 
kind of an unexpected problem. Now I'm curious if we were to shrink this down to zero, zero and make that editable. That is all consistent then. So the maybe that is a better way of spiraling around. So if I were to do 720 times two, um, does it mess up the look of the noodle? I kind of think it does, honestly. So we could do that. That was really sharp. Now, is that actually kind of accurate to what the noodle is, or is it not? Sorry to get real specific here, but I feel like it matters. Yeah, I think it's just, it, does, it doesn't travel this way. It's interesting, the two different forms, because if I do this one, it's all consistent, which is good. But I think the reality of it is that they would be alternating like this. So when we do the thickness, uh, it might, I guess what we might have to do, uh, this is funny, but we can use a uh, volume builder. Let's go and grab a volume builder. We're going to put this into that. And it's pretty tiny, so we're going to drop this down pretty small. And let's go and grab the volume measure and put that inside. And you're going to see it's going to look really funky and wonky there. But what we need to do is click on our volume measure and start increasing our voxel range threshold. You see it's actually kind of giving it thickness. And now thickness is just kind of based on the center point. So now they travel up and down. So uh, once again, volume measure for the win. Um, we could subdivide that a little bit more. We could probably throw in a smoother. The smoothing, by the way, when you start adding the smoothing in, it completely obliterates our uh, voxel range. So we'd have to, uh, actually, that does kind of cause a problem there. The smoothing doesn't work in this instance very well. We can't smooth that out here. We could make a uh, smoothing uh, deformer, and we could do lots of smoothing that way. And it's working all right. Um, and, I mean, there's various things we could do if we wanted to thicken that up. We could probably put a second loft in there and maybe pull this one down so that you see that that introduces a little bit more thickness that way without having to increase the volume. Um, so we, we could subdivide that more, but I'm going to go ahead and call that a noodle. So that is that. Um, so there's a lot of work to just make a noodle. I thought that would be simpler. Um, but uh, so then we'd end up with our die, our general shape that it's taking a bite out of. So what we would do, what I would do here would probably just be uh, take this shape, T for scale, shrink it down, and we'll just make one little slice out of here. So honestly, we would just grab our volume measure, copy and paste it, and then make a bool. We could also use a volume measure on this whole thing, but that might be unnecessary. Um, let's make a bool, and I'm going to feed it the cube, and it's A subtract B usually, so I can put that in. Let's hide this one. And if I grab this one and pull it backward, you're going to see that we can get the kind of the extrusion of what the noodle would be. So it's kind of like that shape. That's how it's actually cutting it out. Now, if you want to make clean bools along these lines, I saw some people talking in Slack earlier about bools. The, uh, the trick I've been doing with bools to make them nice is to turn on hide new edges. And then you can also say, uh, actually, it's just turn on hide new edges. And now you get this very clean piece of geometry where it does end guns for it. But actually, it makes it so that as you feed one bool into another bool, you get actually do get cleaner meshes because you're not introducing all these triangles until they need to exist. Um, okay, cool. So that is that. Uh, now, that's our die. That would be one of the die. We could grab our cube and shrink it up a little bit if we wanted to. Let's go ahead and maybe drop it to 75 by 75. Um, so what we need to do is make it so that as the noodle, the visual noodle, as it kind of would animate through this thing, and let's find them like right there. That's the actual place where it goes. So that's where it matches. So if we were doing this accurately, as it moves forward, it's also spiraling. Now, I don't actually know what that amount is. And I'm trying to think of the easiest way to do it. Because we're, if we build, uh, if we make a tiny espresso rig, it could be fun. But then there's a certain moment I want it to turn dynamic and fall away. And that wouldn't be the case here. I mean, I can't even think of a way of doing it other than, I mean, it's espresso. And then maybe we can activate the dynamics tag. I don't know. We're just going to, we're just going to brute force it right now. So uh, that's a start point right there, which is fine. I hit Alt G just so it's in the group. Let's just name this a noodle. And now we're going to go and make uh, espresso on here and what are we going to be doing with it well we want to worry about the z position so as the z position of the noodle 
So let's go and grab the noodle in. Let's go and grab the coordinate, grab the Z position, drive it. As that is moving forward, we want to, and you know what? Honestly, it'd probably be a good idea to put a child in here and I'm gonna spin this one. So this will be our rotation. Rotation. Um, as that's spinning, and hit R for rotate, we can spin a little bit, and you can see it's B. So it's uh, rotation B is what's going to be spinning. So let's go ahead and drag that null in. I'm going to say I want uh, to control the rotation B. So two different ways of getting the parameter in there. So now all we have to do is create a range mapper. Right-click, new node, hit Expresso, calculate, range mapper. So we're going to now feed in the Z position and output something for the rotation. So we're going to be inputting not huge numbers, but larger numbers. So if I grab this and pull it, let's see how far we move it. So you can see I'm going from, if the noodle was completely outside of it, it's negative 200, if I was completely in front of it, it's about zero. So the noodle is about 200. So 200 seems like a good unit. So we're gonna go anywhere from zero to 200. What are we gonna output? Well, I wanna output some degrees. So let's put degrees. So right now, as we move, we're going to see it's going to spin as it's passing through. And you can see it's actually already doing something pretty well. I'm not even sure if it's spinning the right direction. Um, but definitely, I'm not, I'm not sure if it is spinning the right direction. Even that's hard to tell. Because um, when it lines up, as it backs up, I think it is spinning the correct direction, but not enough. Now, the, the thing is, is what I'm inclined to do is just eyeball this. So we're saying it starts at zero and it's at zero. So let's make sure at, at zero that the output rotation is something that matches. So right now it's a perfect matching thing. So I'm gonna spin it to right about there. So negative 55. So now as we move to 100, it's rotating and we need it to have spun a certain number of times and match again. I think we need to go higher on the rotation. I'm gonna do that, but I don't think that's high enough. I'm gonna grab our upper limit and say uh, 410. Now let's move it in. And if it's not perfectly matching, then we need probably another 360 on there. So I'm gonna say plus 360. Uh, apparently 360 is, oh, this noodle might not end on the same amount. Um, so let's do that. Uh, closer, but a little too much. So let's go ahead and grab that, and I'm going to pull down until we get one counter rotation. And one of these is going to match. Um, not that one. That one is, I think, maybe still too much. It might also be too little. I might be thinking backwards. And when I'm designing these kind of things, like we could do the math and figure it out directly, but I oftentimes just eyeball and guess. I think we might need more, so I'm going to spin one, two, and now we'll get to some new ones in the other direction. Three and push Ooh, there we go look so now as i move this the noodle is counter rotating the exact amount i need it to to come out of the extruder and then right at this moment our blade would come through and chop and then at that moment i would want it to turn dynamic um now i don't actually want this directly to turn dynamic i would want some sort of uh parent to turn dynamic um so uh, let me think. I'm going to make a, this might, hopefully it doesn't get too weird. No, the child. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to make a cylinder. And the cylinder is going to be the dynamics for the noodle. It, it, obviously, it's not matching the noodle very well, but I want something that renders quick, runs quick. So let's go ahead and match the noodle and drag it over. Uh, potentially, we could just tell it to calculate as a, uh, as a cylinder, but I'm not sure if that actually still runs quickly. So there we go. That becomes our dynamic object. Now I want to drop this noodle into the cylinder and have it work, but we've now moved the cylinder over into a weird position. So I'm actually going to make a null, and that null is at zero, zero, zero. So if I make the null a child of the cylinder, and I make the noodle a child of the null, nothing should change. It should be working. Um, so now that noodle is independently moving forward, and and our cylinder is not being affected, and we can tell the Cylinder not to render, but we do want the stuff underneath it to I tend to not like doing that, but we should be able to rewind. Actually, I never recorded um, So let's go ahead and do a recording. Uh, that's where it should end. So I don't know how long it'll take. Let's say 45 seconds I'm going to record the Z position and then rewind all the way and now the noodle should be right at its start position Oop! don't move the cylinder. I recorded the wrong one 
uh, we want to make sure we record this uh, animate Z so uh, that's where I want to animate the Z so record there and now uh, Sorry, at the time of 45, record that position, Re rewind, and now rewind, pull this backward until we're at the very start of the noodle, and we'll do another keyframe. So now that should automatically go forward and stop. Um, honestly, it would probably want to be a constant range, so let's go and select those and say linear keyframe. So that should linearly move forward. Because we have an espresso rig, the rotation automatically matches. But now as that travels over, suddenly the cylinder would become a dynamic object at this time so let's go ahead and add a actually we want to be at the time of zero so let's right click and we'll add a simulation a rigid body and it is uh, automatic is fine but I'm gonna tell it that's a moving mesh and I'm gonna tell it that the dynamics are off until so they're off at 45 record and I can hold down alt as I move so the keyframes aren't actually changing and I can say on and record so now that it's not dynamic. So with any luck, this will, and I haven't saved this yet, dangerous. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, let's go ahead and name this to A. And we'll call it Noodles. N noodle Cut. So with any luck, this will play forward and the dynamics will take over and it will fall away. Cool, actually working it's shockingly well. So, um, yeah, we should be able to let that go and then chop and it falls away. And um, yeah, it would just be repeating this process. Now, I don't, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of there to be any way of like cloning it so you could do a whole series of these, like doing it again and again and again. Um, honestly, nothing's coming to mind. I wish it was, but it's not. Um, now those, everything is keyframed. We've got Expresso running and Expresso might stop it from working because if we were to put this into a cloner and let's say that we made a train of them. So we would do uh, a couple of them clones backwards. So each subsequent clone is pushed backwards. It already matches really well. So it's cool. Um, and we'd want that to have been, I mean, that's zeroed out, but we want this actually to be moved forward this amount boom so now it should be matching but if we hit play um they're all going to be traveling forward they're all keyframes but then yeah those will stop doing their thing and then they'll all turn dynamic at the same time and fall away it's really weird how that's why is that choking on this early part i mean once again it, that could be the espresso i don't know no it's not the espresso um, they are all spinning, but that's because they're all just identical clones. The, now, the trick would come in if we could offset our keyframes. So right now, um, let's see, there's a parameter for that. Uh, right now, the time is set to play mode, but I don't want it to loop. I don't want it to play. I want it to be offset. How do I offset each time? Um, I think this is an absolute one if I were to push this forward or backward. If I push it backward, they all move. So that's not what I want. Play is fine. I guess all I want to do is add a offset. So I'm going to say uh, MoGraph step effector, step effector. And I don't want it to control. I want the spline to be linear. So let's right click on the spline, say linear spline. And I don't want it controlling scale. I want it controlling, uh, I don't want it. I want it controlling time. So it takes 45 frames for each one to animate. So I'm going to say 45 frame offset. And let's hit play. And it looks like it's spinning backwards. So maybe we need a negative. So now they're all pushed forward. I could probably fix that by offsetting. Shouldn't this be offsetting each one? Yeah, this should, one, this should be affecting each one subsequently. But it's pushing it forward. Um, yeah, I'm a little. Uh, I like I said, I I didn't think we could build it into a cloner. There might be a way of putting it into a cloner, or um, or even spawning. Let me think. If we were to spawn one.
Well, okay. Well, here's a weird, here's a thing that might work. Um, no cloner, but if we were to loop this animation going forward, uh, also, this is the cylinder's in the wrong position. I'm going to just pull that forward. Oopsie, what's going on? Oh, yeah, that's supposed to be all the way in the back, not forward. I was like, I did something wrong there. Okay, so if I had to play, it's going to travel forward and then turn dynamic and fall. So if we instead made a second rig, so if I copy-paste this, we'll make it so this cylinder doesn't do anything, and then that one were just to loop, it would go forward and then back and then forward and back. Then, and uh, the best way to do that would be signal, obviously. Um, so signal is a plugin from Grayscale Gorilla. Uh, one that I made, or I helped design, so I really do like it. So instead of animating the Z with keyframes, let's go ahead and animate it with signal. Let's get a quick reference for what, where it's animating from. So right now it's going from 176, which I've copied, and it's traveling to 12.5. So instead, let's tell Z to be taken over by signal. And it's going to go from there to 12.5. It already saw the initial one. We can go ahead and say linear animation. And I'm going to now say loop. So that's going to loop there. Now, this one doesn't have dynamics attached to it. So let's go ahead and entirely... Actually, I'm going to delete this one temporarily. I'm going to hit X, uh, control X to delete. I just want you to see if I play, that should go forward. And then when it hits the end, it's going to pop back to the beginning. So essentially, we have this infinite noodle scrolling forward and then jumping back. And because we don't see behind the machine, that should automatically work. So now, essentially what we need is to emit um, these cylinders in their final position. So let's delete the keyframe off of our second noodle. Let's move it into its final position, which is right about there. Um, although it does... Oddly, uh, seems spun a little bit. I'm not sure what I did wrong there. Where is it? Man oh, I guess it is matching. Yeah, it's matching. Uh, okay, so that that's kind of the position in which it would go. And really, we just need that to suddenly emit. So this one, I don't even think we need the cylinder. I'm going to pull this out of the cylinder so we don't even have to confuse those dynamics. And this one is dynamic, and we need it to emit every one particle every 45 Frames. Let's go ahead and give this a save as number B. Uh, so I don't think we can actually make the basic Cinema 4D emitter emit like that. So if we said emitter and we set that to, let's put it as a child because it should be right where that is. And I'll say zero. So it's exactly there. Pull it out. It's got the same rotation and everything. We could say emitter size of zero, zero. But if we said... I want to emit forever, but right now there's the editor speed and the renderer speed. But here's the problem is you can't go below one, and we would need it to go below one. Now, one possible idea would be if we were to keyframe a cloner to start generating more clones. So if we said linear, um, let's say that we had a count of one and the spacing is zero. Uh, we also needed this to be offset to wherever the cylinder is, so I'll drop it in the cylinder. Zero that out so it takes on the position. Put it in, okay, cool. So that should be dynamic right away. It should, oh, it's not because I still have a keyframe. So turn that off, this is just always dynamic. So we hit play, immediately that falls away and we have the next noodle come. So what we would need to do is keyframe the count to go up by one every 45 frames. We already use signal a little bit, so this is another perfect opportunity to try and use signal. So I'm gonna add signal, and I want to control the count, and I'm gonna say that the count should be a linear existence of one. Actually, it's gonna go from one to two, so there's already one at the beginning, and it's gonna go up to two at the time of 45. I'm gonna say the playback should be additive. So it's gonna go from one to two, then two to three, then four to five, and I just want to see if when we generate a second clone, if the second clone gets created and if the first one is still there. Let's create a floor, pull it down here, and add a dynamics tag to the floor. Save it, and let's hit play. Boom, noodle, boom, noodle, boom, noodle. Uh, okay, there is hope for this, actually. To make a more advanced kind of rig here. Um, so that is falling away right away, which we want it to. But then we have a second one up here really quick. Uh, 45 frames. 
maybe we do want it at one. Maybe there just isn't one on the first one, so we'll go zero to one. So now there isn't a, oh, no, why did it make that? Think, think, do. Let's see what the cloner is doing. The cloner says, I have zero clones, and then hit play. Oh, um, it must be that because we're in integers, this is hitting a like halfway point. So it's going to like 0.5 and then suddenly jumping up to one. So what we can do, this is cool, hopefully this works, is we have inside of our output a setting that got added in signal 1.5 called um, step variation. What step variation does is it makes it so that you're only going to whole numbers of a certain kind. So I'm going to say I want whole numbers of one because prior to that, actually let's turn this off, if I were to hit play, uh, count, volume, step, where's our, okay, where now you see our final output, let's hit play, no, that's actually, it is jumping on that, I still think we're jumping on that one, let's just, let's just try it, I'm going to turn on our step variation, might not actually work, yeah, it's still, one, two, it's going way too fast. Our, our noodles, I thought our noodles were taking exactly 45 frames to go. Maybe that's what I'm getting wrong. How long did it take our noodle to keyframe? Oh, okay. I, I, apologies, apologies. I know what I did. I know what I did. Um, Remember, we had it keyframed to animate on Z, and it's going every 45 frames, but I added signal, and signal took over. Signal is no longer keyframing it. But I didn't set signal to 45 frames. I set it to 90, or is at the default of 90. So if we set that to 45, and we set this to 45, and it's going from 1 to 2 additively, we don't need to worry about step. It was creating double the number of noodles that we needed. So noodle, or is it still doing something? So we still get a noodle. And then another one gets made at the halfway point. So maybe now the problem is happening. Although I don't think it is. Boom, boom. Still twice as many. So I guess maybe we have to cut it in half. Because um, we're hitting some sort of halfway point. So let's go ahead and say uh, 90 frames. Why not? Yeah, there we go. Okay, okay, okay. Looking good. Let's add some more frames. This one's fun. Um... So that's going to be infinite, and now this is going to, and both of them are, it's an infinite rig now. These are each going to, that's going to loop forever, and this one is going to go forever. So if we were to um, just hit play, boom, falls off, boom, falls off, and we're just going to get noodle after noodle after noodle, um, and it's just working really well. We might want to go and put a... Um, a little bit of an initial velocity on there. So I'm going to say custom initial velocity. We have X, Y, Z. So I'm going to give it an initial velocity of 55, which I have no idea if that's way too much or not. It looks like we want negative 55. So now it gets created and yeah, it spits it forward. So hopefully it's got kind of that same movement. Um, honestly, it seems less than the what we're spinning. Um, so now we, yeah, there we go. So now it feels a little bit more like it's mo maintaining that momentum as it goes forward. Um, it would probably visually help if we put a white material on there. So it's going to carry that through for us. Crank that up. So now, I mean, just for fun, because it's looking, it's looking so uh, surprisingly accurate, honestly. Let's go ahead and uh, clean up this rig a little bit, and we'll make all three of the noodles. So we'll put that in. So now we've got a null, and we'll just call this cutter one. And now what's cool is because we got such a clean setup, uh, my hope is let's go ahead and make a cylinder and we'll spin that around. Make it over the cutting blade. We're not even looking at the reference, but let's go ahead and say that we have something like that. Um, so let's go ahead and scoot that over. Yeah, I'll just do that. That's fine with me. Um, so that becomes one. So I'm going to drop that as a child. I'm also going to copy and paste it. So there's another one. I'm going to grab this cutter, and I'm going to say uh, the cutter wheel. Or is that the right cylinder? Oopsie. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to copy the cutter and paste it. So that was one inside the cylinder and one outside of it. So now we want to rotate this one-third of 360. So I'm going to do 360 divided by 3. It is 120. And now I drag, I'm going to hold down... Uh, control and drag a copy of it inside the cylinder and let's rotate it another 120 so it's going to be 240 
spin around again, and there we go. Now we've got three cutters inside of this one shape, and each one is doing their own thing. Now, with any luck, yeah, it's all three of them are just going to be working and get created. But, of course, if we have our spinning blade, we'll need those to be offset. So, that shouldn't be too difficult. Let's go ahead, and I'm, I'm not going to worry about making the cutter blade look nice. I'm just going to go and make a cylinder here. Or I'm going to go and make a cube here, nice and thin. Not quite so long. Let's pull this over to the front. So let's say that's our cutting blade. Let's go ahead and make it a color. We'll just, that is not the right window. That's the right window. Go away, Expresso. We don't need you anymore. Uh, we'll go to Reflectance, Remove, Add, Beckman. There you go, shiny. There we go. We are shiny, shiny cutting blade. Uh, at a single unit fillet, so we got a little bit of bevel on there. So uh, we got that. Uh, our cylinder is offset, so I'm actually going to zero that out on uh, zero, zero. Obviously, this rotation doesn't even need to be rotated anymore. So there we go. We got our three noodles, and we've got our blade. Let's grab our blade and move it up in the air a little bit, and we can make a null or a cylinder. I mean, honestly, we probably should make a cylinder. Let's make another cylinder. We'll point it forward. And T for scale, and we'll make that longer. And there we go. So we got something for that to bounce off of. So we'll also make this dynamic. Um, we will just make it a collider body, actually. I'll steal that right from the uh, floor. And now we're going to infinitely spin this. So I'm going to right click and let's add another signal tag. We've already broken the seal, so let's go nuts. Uh, we're going to be spinning this one on probably B again. Yep, it's B. Grab B. And we're going to tell it to cut. Now, we are going to need to time this out specifically. I don't know what that timing is yet, so I'm not worried yet. I'm going to say just over the course of 90 frames, although we did change it to 45, uh, I guess it should spin 360. So every 45 frames spin 360 is the idea. So that's spinning now. We can put our cutter blade on it. And let's turn on SSAO. And let's make up color for that background one so these things aren't all blending into each other and then hey why not let's make a noodle color um yeah noodle 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 uh Shouldn't that be filtering down? What's the... Uh, oh, I've made that white material. Uh, replace the white material. I'm holding out Alt or Option as I drag, and I can merge it into those other materials. There we go. Everything's just popping out a little bit more. Why don't we make this red a little bit? Okay, cool. Just something that we can see. So now our blade is spinning. So now what we need to do is offset a bunch of these by 45. Now what's cool is we got Signal here. So I can grab... Not 45. Um, I guess because they're animating... It's taking 45 frames for them to travel. Honestly, 45 is a bad number, but what's cool is we can fix that. Um, what we really want is a nice clean number that we can divide by three. So let's go ahead and say it's actually 60. So it's actually gonna take 60 frames for that to happen. Uh, I think the entire rig will just update and continue to work, which is awesome. Oh, we should also have those spin when they spit out, but we'll fix that in a minute. Um, so now uh, we can offset this set by 20. I can grab offset and say I want to offset by 20 units. And I'm going to grab the next. I guess that would be that one. You know what? Let's not do that one. That's the first one. The first one's not going to be offset. The second one is going to be offset by 20 frames. And the third one's going to be offset by 40 frames. So now they're all offset. So now we should have three noodles each coming out at slightly separate times. Um, the. Uh, which is all good, except that uh, maybe we need the initial, the, uh, the noodles that are getting pulled out by the extrudes. Maybe this should go down to zero and one. Let's see, let's see. Were they already offset? Because it seems like... Oh, 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 okay, I know I did. Um, remember, remember we saw that the uh, cloner was spitting out twice as many as it was supposed to, so we had to cut the time in half? I forgot to do that. So when I made it 60, this was actually supposed to be 120. So our noodle will come out, 
and then boom, become dynamic. Boom, be yeah, there we go. There we go, there we go, there we go. All right, cool. So now we have our spinning blade. Let's tell that to be additive, so it's constantly spinning. And now it should spin once every 60 frames. So it should be going, oh, wow. It's already lined up. Uh, cut, 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 cut. Um, there we go. Um, the uh, blade obviously could be sharper. Honestly, this should be, if this was, sp if everything was going twice as fast, I'd be a little happier. I mean, because of the way we built the rig, it's super easy to do that. I can say that this should happen over the course of, um, I guess, we might have to do 0.5 here, but if that could be 30 frames. We grab these three, and I can say that they should be happening every 60 frames, and we can grab the, and then the offsets we'll have to fix as well, but we can grab these three and tell them they should happen every 30 frames. And then we have our offset. So that's, uh, this should be half of the amount offset. So that should be 15. No, that's not true. It should be a third. So it should be 20. And this one should also be 20. And then these should be 10. Those should be offsets of 10. Noodle, noodle, chop, chop. There's a little uh, pop there. Pop. Yeah, right there. Frame every frame. So it chops the noodle successfully, travels through. We probably make the blade thinner. It will help as well. Yeah, that one. Um, it's still got one clone. Are they all doing that? <laughs> 60 frames. 30. It's taking twice as long for them to do it. Uh, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have sped it up because we were we were looking good. Now it's just kind of wasting time. Um, so those take 30 frames and they're offset by 10 and 20, which is an extra third. That goes back around to a third. That makes perfect sense. These are good. We can do the initial count, but that doesn't change anything. Uh, that just is going to drop those. It seems to be cutting every other single one, but we already know that it needs the time to be cut in half. Or at least that seemed to. Yeah, now it seems like there's twice as many. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, um, one moment, uh, how do I, here's a problem, like, I want to hide these two, but because I made, I forced, oh, actually, these can become visible again, because we got rid of the parent, so I can do that, I just want to hide these, let's just worry about one, we'll figure this out, didn't I say, uh, oh, it is a child of it there, it does mess it up there, but I can just turn the cloner off. Just remember to turn that on. Okay, we're back to one. Okay, so. Yeah, it's doing every other one. Okay, interesting. Um, so, if it's 60, I want to go up twice as fast, I would do 30. But as I do 30... That seems strange. Maybe we have to offset it by half the length of time. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. Uh, I don't have an intuition for this, but it seems like a way of fixing it was just, it should match the same amount of speed. It was just offset by, uh, it was offset by half a, a rotation and I was fixing it by doubling the amount. It was doing every other one. So really, they should have always been matching the same length of time. They never should have been double. They just need to be offset by an extra half a length. So naturally, this one is supposed to be offset by 15. And this one is already offset by 10, so we actually have to offset by 25. And then this one is offset by 20, so it should be offset by 35. Um, I hope that sort of all makes sense to everybody.
Noodle chop, noodle chop, noodle chop, noodle chop. There we go. Oh, look at the gorgeous noodles. All right, loving it, loving it. That's looking great. The only thing I want to do is introduce some rotation into the clones when they're created, which is really easy. All we have to do is grab the three dynamic cylinders dynamic tag and give it some initial rotation. We already know B is the magic number. I have no idea what the rotation should be, so I'm just going to guess. Let's try 90 degrees, and let's see what it does. Actually, it looks like B is tilting it backwards. So is it not B? I don't know. Uh, no good way of telling right there unless we crank up the speed. Oh yeah, okay, now it's going. And um, yeah, I think we want the opposite. So let's try negative five, 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 five. You see, I immediately put a big number in there so I could see it. Yeah, there we go. And actually, look, it seems like it's doing a really good job of uh, continuing the spin. The blade is doing a good job of spinning around. We've got the three different cuts. So we got cut one, cut two, cut three. It's actually kind of the opposite. But um, then we got the blade. I want to thin that out a little bit. Let's make this three, and we'll make this mm, 12. Yeah. So yeah, a little quicker blade, so we just don't see it intersecting. And uh, the dynamics are going to run incredibly fast because of these being noodles, and then you could have those continue down the path. So I'm actually, I didn't, I didn't think we'd be able to get this working as well as we did. Um, but yeah, just that simple looping rig, and essentially we create an, an emitter by telling the cloner to create the next clone, the next clone, the next clone. Uh, and then, you know, if this was part of the factory, you would go and make a dynamic cylinder or a tube here. Let's face this on Z, make it a little bit bigger. And then we'd only make this uh, slice 108, oop, slice of 180. And now we could make our tube nice and long, T for scale. Yeah, and you do something like this. And then R for rotate, bend that down. And now they have some place to, uh, to go after they're cut. We don't need our floor anymore. I'm going to steal its dynamics tag and get rid of the floor and tell it to be dynamic on, collision shape, static mesh. Now, as the noodles get cut, they should be able to fall into our slide and then slide away. And we've got our noodle extruding machine. It'll make noodles forever. Make one big box here so we don't see them uh, getting spawned behind it. Chop, 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 chop. Awesome, we got our noodle chopper. Uh, that was fun. Um, it would be nice to make a, a slightly, uh, a, a, a shape of the noodles that's just a little bit more dynamic, like a low poly version, so you could actually have them bounce and intersect with each other, because right now they are just cylinders. Um, and I think it worked well enough, and we're getting really great real-time feedback. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's amazing how well that tricks the eye, because, like, that extrudes and it suddenly looks like it's chopped off, but really that one jumps back inside and the next one is, you know, just a new emission sliding away. Um, so, yeah, pretty neat. Um, that, there's even a chance where I would do something like make these uh, soft body. Uh, actually, this, okay, we're going to take a half second and see if we can do it. Um, if we were to grab our three cylinders, so cylinder, cylinder, cylinder if i uh reduce this to like uh 12 segments and let's give it some height segments of like i don't know four and oh wait no 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 i'm not gonna do this never mind i'm not gonna do it um because we'd have to go and put them into a, a uh what do you call it the moving mesh the um uh, mesh deformer uh we'd have to put them in a mesh deformer to make them get deformed but if we did a very low poly um Thing, we could actually have these be a little bit floppy and bendy so they could actually still bend because these are going to be soft like flour. They're pretty much just a flour. So, you know, there could be a little bit of bend. Right now they're quite stiff, but, you know, you could do that with a with a mesh deformer. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to do another question here. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, all the chats are going to be further up. Um, do, 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 or all the questions. I'm scrolling up further. What do we got? What do we got? Um, hmm. WS Meeks is asking about opening of a pine cone, and I am familiar with the concept, even without clicking the link. It's incredibly difficult because it's almost like fish scales or something where they just kind of very organically overlay or like flower petals. I mean, I guess pine cone is a, practically a flower. 
um, as far as the way it, it's shaped, where like they kind of just magically, organically push into each other, and <sighs> yeah, I just don't think we're gonna get something cool out of it. Uh, Sulk is asking if Signal can drive any parameter of an Arnold material, um, so you can have a flickering effect. Um, yeah, you totally can. Uh, I think we can do this really quick. Um, let's open up a new one. Uh, I'm going to make a cube. Let's go ahead and turn on Arnold. And I'm not going to do anything fancy here, but we've got Arnold. And let's go ahead and make a new Arnold material. Surface. Um, let's see. I guess a standard surface. Uh, by the way, I don't know Arnold at all. So let's see. Um, base, specular. I'm guessing there's an emission. Yeah, emission. And here's the weight. So we crank that up, and now it's it's... It is indeed a uh, emissive material, and now we've got that. We could make a floor, so we have something to be being lit. T for scale. Um, create another Arnold material. This could go for anything, by the way. Oh, let's make another standard surface. We'll apply that there, and let's create. I'm gonna hit Command B in Arnold, and uh, we'll give the diffuse a couple extra bounces. And output a animation, all frames. Uh, we do not need a big resolution, so we're going to divide that by two. Don't worry about saving. Um, so now we've got that material. So we can just go ahead and add signal anywhere. So I'm going to add a signal tag, Grayscale Gorilla Signal. And let's add that signal tag. And on top of there, let's go ahead and drag in our weight onto our our signal tag and when you click on signal you'll see it actually created a dynamic link over to that particular material and now that should be controlling it so right now it's up at one what we should probably do is say well you want it to be yeah you want the flicker so it's going to be up at one and you see it's maxed out at one all the time so it's constantly one but now we can create a noise and you want a flicker so what we can say is i want this to go negative up to one and Honestly, just doing that uh, should work pretty well. We could go and, um, yeah, just doing that should pretty be pretty good. I'm going to set it up to three. Uh, we crank up our bias a little bit. It should make it, uh, crank it up to the extremes more often. So we're not going to see in the viewport, but you can see right here how this is flickering. And that's, um, it's not, it's staying up, down, up, down. Now where things get interesting, this is kind of, the, right there, that's one. And here is zero. So you can see it's kind of going between almost full and zero. But where things get more interesting is if we go to advanced, we can say remap the strength of the noise. So right now it's even all the way through. But I could go and select our points and then say soft. Interp you know, we're going to interpret this softly. And I'm going to say most of the time you're, oh, now you're flickering really low. So I actually want the opposite. I'm going to say most of the time you're going to be up really high. You're going to be up near your peak. But if you happen to get to this extreme, then it can go black. So you can see we're flickering really near the maximum. If we want to, we could actually really crank it up. We could do this where it's like flat on top. So it's pretty much always at its maximum. And if we start increasing our bias more, then we're more likely to occasionally get to a point where it really flickers. So we can go and just kind of lay this out and kind of the probability of it flickering. So now think of this as what the light is going to do and kind of finding the balance here. Flicker, 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 flicker. So there we go. So that's looking pretty good. I think that would work pretty well. Um, let's go ahead and do a quick save on here. So we'll do number 3A. This is just uh, uh, Arnold Flicker with GSG Signal. Uh, so now, hopefully, if I hit render... Um, yeah, so, uh, and I have the demo version here, but you can see it's going to process through and it's uh, super emissive and bright and hopefully at a certain frame, it's going to get dimmer. Yeah. So you can see right there, it got dimmer. We won't be able to see anything until it's kind of done animating a little bit. Um, now having said that, there's a couple different things that signal could control as well, even with this tag, the way it is, we were controlling the, um, and I'll save that is saved. 
But in this Arnold material, we're controlling the weight. But what if I said, I don't want to control the weight. I want to control the color. So I drag the color in there instead. Let's put the full color up there. And now inside of the signal tag, we're actually controlling. It's saying it should be white all the time. But then here, I'm going to say, I'm going to feed up to white. And I can go down negative. And now when I hit play, you can actually see uh, our... RGB, each of them is flickering independently doing their own thing. So if I go to my output, you can see our final color here is flickering to a whole bunch of different colors, which by itself is kind of cool. Um, but here's where things get interesting with Signal, is that's a nice big flicker of, uh, of variation in color. But maybe that's a little too much. I could pull the strength back here. Um, so you can see on our output, that's just, I want to get a little bit more. Um, you can see here that there's a little bit of color variation, but not much. But I could add a second noise. In fact, why don't I duplicate the current one? So I'm going to say duplicate that noise. And here I'm going to say I want uniform manipulation of it. So now you can see that it's flickering, but it's flickering in a uniform way. So X, Y, and Z are the same. So now if I give this a different random seed, we are both flickering the color a little bit independently and a major amount of the color. So when we go to output, we're actually flickering up and down a lot with the brightness, but a little bit of them independently as well. So, so those two noises added together to combine in a new, more complex way. So we get that little bit of color flickering in there. We could even go and rename this uh, color. So this is now a color tab. Pull this back because I don't think we actually want that much color flicker. But yeah, a little bit of color variation in there. And the uh, major amounts of the black shifting around. Um, so yeah, that should work well there uh, and do the exact same effect. Um, this is about halfway done, but let's see what we get. So hit play, and there we go. You can see we've got uh, we've definitely got some uh, flickering working there. And then it even pushes further. I wouldn't mind seeing it. We're going to make it a lot smaller. Command V because we don't need this to be very big. Divide that in half again. There's probably some very simple Arnold. Oh, and I didn't cut our vertical one in half. No wonder. There we go. That's why the screen size jumped. So that should render really quick. Uh, and I'm sure there's settings in Arnold to uh, decrease these uh, render settings. Um, just not something I play around with too much. Bucket size, maybe. No, I don't know those. But, um, yeah, I'm going to ignore that because whatever. But now we've got the exact same effect going here. But I could see from the flickering there that it would have been nice if the flickering was a little faster. So I'm going to double the speed of one noise. I'm going to go a little bit more than double on the other. So we have two different uh, flickery noises going. And then even here on our advanced, on our uh, remap strength, because we're going quicker, we can allow it to stretch out more. Um, although I wouldn't mind putting a little more bias in there. Um, so there we go. So now we should be controlling the color of the Arnold light. And we should get a lot more flicker a lot quicker. Um, rendering nice and quick. And now we got a little bit of color variation, but mostly um, the black and white getting pulled down. It's a negatively affecting the white color. Hit play. Flicker, 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 flicker. So yeah, uh, really straightforward to uh, be able to control those kind of things. And there's so many cool, interesting, dynamic ways they can be combined. Um, okay, uh, so let's go ahead and kill that. That's working well. Um, I just know what links are for me. So we go up to a link from Michael Liu. Um, how would you approach this 2D looking facial expression in Cinema 4D, nine minutes in? Let's see what we got. I'm going to turn off the sound. Hopefully we don't get some sound overlapping. Um, so, nine minutes in. First of all, what are we looking at here? Pocoyo's Summer Bundle, produced by Zin Zinkia Entertainment SA. Um, English, full episodes. It looks like, I'm assuming, this is some sort of children's animation. Um, and it's Zinkia Studio. So, yeah, <laughs> okay, cute. Um, so let's jump to nine minutes, which is what you're calling for. Yeah, these cutesy animations. Dude, these kind of animations are huge. People go nuts for them. Uh, I think you're probably referring to the whale. <laughs> uh, the uh, squid there is great. Okay, I like the expressions they're doing here. It's pretty good. Um, but yeah, okay, so you're, uh, really the question here is how, you, how to do like a 2D sort of animation or 2D graphic animation on a 3D model. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a very, very good answer to that. There's a lot of different potential techniques. Um, 
I mean, first of all, you could do you could just do that animation separately in After Effects for one. That would be something that would be viable. The other would be doing stuff like what we almost just did, where we could project one shape onto another shape. So um, we don't have any of the models, unfortunately. I'll have to make sure I get those installed. Let me make a note of that right now. Uh, apologies, but let me make a note. Otherwise, I will forget. So uh, add R20 default models, just so we have them. Um, and then, uh, yeah, because that'd be a lot easier, or a lot more interesting. Now, granted, uh, the characters and everything we just saw were really straightforward, so, you know, it wouldn't be difficult for us to model something up. Uh, I don't have anything particular in mind, but just like this, MG is going to round this out quite a bit, and then we can go and start stretching out individual polygons, pull that out, grab this, pull it out, grow, pull it out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, whatever. Let's just say this is like the head of a character. So we D for extrude, pull that out. Uh, I for inner extrude, D for extrude, T for scale. You know, and that's going to be the shoulders going out. So we'll select that all. Uh, MG for rounding it out. Let's round that out a little bit more. Cool. So let's say this is going to be like the face of some sort of character. Um, I guess it, this would be a lot a little less creepy if I hit another extrusion here. Pull that out. T for a scale. D, okay, so there we go. We got like the head of something. So this is the head of a character. We can right click and subdivide. We'll in fact even do a smooth subdivision on there. So there's a little bit more geometry. So there we go. Um, so let's just say uh, they had some cartoony flat eyeballs so we could make a round rig Let's go and make that white, and I can go and pull this forward, and that's supposed to be his eyeball. So we can pull this forward, and potentially, let's go and grab our bu 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 shrink wrap deformer, drop that on the disk, and we'll drop in our cube, and boom, it's projecting it instantly onto that surface. Now that's the disk doing that, but we've got a couple options to push it back off again. We could, for one, grab our displaced deformer, and put the displace after the shrink wrap, and I'm gonna just feed in a color white. So now it's pushing off just a little bit. It's pushing off however much I tell this to. So we probably don't need to go too far, maybe one or even two units, and that's enough for it to pop off that surface that little bit. And then as an alternative, this disc might have not been a flat disc, but it could have been a cylinder. So we could go and make a cylinder instead, and we'll rotate that one. That's another disc. What am I doing? Go away, disc. I wanted a cylinder. There we go. Uh, let's make it a thickness of three. We'll do Z plus. Pull that out. And now we've got that as the eyeball. Make that white. And let's steal the shrink wrap on that one. And now what would end up happening, well, first of all, it's going nuts. Um, we might want to put that into a connect object and then put the shrink wrap in the connect as well. And then we might need to move it so that it's actually over the surface. Ooh, that is not great. Um, along normals, do we need more subdivisions? Mm. Not great. Okay. Well, that <laughs> ignore that cylinder part. It was working great on the disk. Um, what, what I was going to say is that we could add some some thickness onto the disc after the fact. And in fact, even here, I don't know how subdivided it is, but yeah, we could add some extra subdivisions on there that should make help match that shape a little bit more overall. And as long as all this got subdivided in the end, that should work pretty well. But keep in mind that we could probably be creating a second disc that's supposed to be inside there. And uh, Shift-C, PSR, reset that. And let's make a black material. We got a black material in here. Drop that on the disk. Let's check the chat, make sure there's no emergencies going on. Seems okay. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of an ET vibe going on them. Uh, so we do that, T for scale, shrink that up. That is interesting. Why? Um, is the normal facing the right, wrong direction, Z minus? Is it supposed to be that kind of normal? Is it the normal of this object projecting? Uh, it could be. But yeah, so we can do that. So now you can see we've got that little eyeball popping on there, and then potentially we could say this one should displace outward more. Does that work like that? I thought it would. 
because that's pushing both of them out. This one, I think, should push that one out. Hmm, strange. Oh, maybe maybe the shrink wrap is getting applied after the fact. I guess that might make sense. Um, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, yeah, I guess they'd they have to be... We'd want that to be separate rig then? I mean, this is not this is not a great example because, yeah, we could go and do the same rig and repeat it. So now you can see we've got two of those. And the point being is we could grab this eyeball and it's really easy to go and pull this around. You can see it's going to be looking around and doing different details there. So that's kind of one type of projection by using geometry on top of the other piece of geometry. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of thing can be fun. You know, you can be kind of cute. Like big eyes are nice and innocent. Um, so yeah, something like this could potentially work. And especially if everything got put into a subdivision after the fact, that would work well. Um, there's all there's so many different potential ways. I mean, like I said, you could be doing those keep that animation in After Effects and reapplying it here as a purely as a material. Um, stuff could be getting created and flattened on top of each other to become. Um, let me think. Um, I mean, there's. I'm trying to think that would the best way I would do it. Like this is actually working pretty well. Um, it's working better than I thought it would. You see, we do get some distortion on the eye as it moves up into the uh, different areas, so that is a potential problem. Um, but it is matching it on the skin and the material really well. Um, at the same time, I mean, there, man, there's a bazillion different options if, as I think about it, because that, you know, this is kind of one, but then imagine this is going to be a weird one, but like, check this out. If we copy and paste, actually, I'm gonna, let's, he's weird. He's a weird little guy, but let's, uh, go ahead and save it. Uh, weird little guy um if we copy and paste that entire thing into a new file if we made a volume out of it so if you put him in the volume builder and drop the volume builder and volume measure then now we've got that but if our initial one um let's copy it so now we've got the initial mesh and we got the secondary one and if we were to intersect it with a circle of some kind so let's say we pull this out like that now, what I really want to do is put this original one into something that gives a thickness, like a cloth surface. And let's go ahead and give it some thickness. So it's inflating out. And now if I put the sphere in there, we can say, I only want to see where these two are intersecting each other. So now I've actually just pushed that mesh out and then intersected it with a sphere. And now wherever that sphere goes is where our little eyeball is going to go. Uh, and then if we were to you know, increase this, I mean, there's a horrible use of polygons, but stylistically, like this, anywhere I put this, we're going to be getting this perfect little round eyeball right on the surface. And then even beyond that, we could go further by adding a Cinema 4D uh, character tag. So we can add a constraint tag. There we go. That's what I was looking for. So we can add a clamp. and put that to clamp onto the surface. So we can say we kind of want to link to the surface with zero distance as nothing, but we could say as a norm or turn off normals and we say as a normal. And now if I were to pull this around, you see I'm actually stuck to the surface. And if I were to keyframe this, it would actually be stuck to the surface. Um, so this is a really weird technique, but you can see I'm, I'm clearly getting an eyeball out of it. And even along those lines, like that's one volume measure, but copy and paste again, calculations on these would be insane, but I could scale that one up, make a, uh, make that one white. And then let's make this one the thickness thicker. And this sphere, I'm going to say this one should be not clamping, but locked to the PSR of the other one. So now as I grab this one, it's stuck to the surface. And then this one is going to have to follow it. So now we've got both of them successfully moving around. But if we want to go further, we could put that into a group 
and move that. Um, maybe you can't put that into a group. Doesn't seem to. Oh wait, it does. Oh, funky. Oh, intersect. Okay, I just had to acknowledge the null um, because I changed the hierarchy. But now you can see I've uh, now anywhere I move the sphere, that little eyeball will move. But I could grab the sphere and independently move that one as well. So I could move that inside of it, and now that would be maintained. And I could even grab the other sphere and move it. Now that's maintaining that. So there's a lot of really weird things that we can do here, and even the sphere, like you know these spheres it would be simple to like scale them up or it's like oh he's surprised um or super cute now um and then um i don't know this is weird this is a weird technique i wouldn't have specifically thought of this but there's so many little interesting things with it um even this black pupil that's working pretty well um, if that was in the null, I'm going to put that into another null. And now I'm going to make sure that that says intersect. And now if I were to make a cube, it's almost like, this is almost like a weird, like almost claymation vibe. But yeah, if I were to make a cube here and just intersect it and put this into that same intersection, then look, it automatically is going to create this little mouth. And now just by moving this around, I'm getting this shape, and the shape will just automatically move and generate wherever I move that. And it's part of that same, as long as it's black, it's automatically part of that same volume. So this is weird, but I think it's pretty unique as well. Like, it, you almost get, like, this claymation-y type of vibe. Um, I wouldn't want to do that. That's weird. But, yeah, by doing this, you can do that. And, uh, you know, even if you want him to talk, you know, everything's in this null now. So I could do an Alt-G. Grab the uh, hit L for axis and pull it back here. And now if I were to do two of those, turn off L for that. But now I could go like blah, 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 blah. But, uh, you know, that's that's using this cube. And there's kind of like those lips if we wanted to do it that way. But instead of that, I mean, it could be that this mouth is just this cube. And you could go like blah, 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 blah. Hi, hello. Uh, and then, you know, man, it just goes on and on. This is actually pretty intriguing because I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. Um, we grab the cylinder and put that over here. So now that becomes the mouth. Put that into that one null. So that's his mouth. Um, it's almost like a Charlie Brown type of mouth. And then we say, um, go in here and turn on slice. So now we got our slices. So now we can say I want that like that and like that. So yeah, if we get this wedge going, yeah, pinch that way in like that. There we go. Now intersect, increase the radius. There we go. That's what I wanted. So now, by uh, but if we were to animate these, we could actually have the mouth be opening and closing. I guess you want them to go down like the jaw. So like. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, I like the cube a little bit better. It's a little more stylish. But look, he's smiling. And it's just a cylinder intersecting. Like, there's a, there's a lot of weird, weird things here. I don't know. It's kind of cool. Um, not something I had specifically ever thought about, but I like it. Um, the idea of these little little intersections creating the blobs. Um, yeah, it just makes me want to keep layering them up. If we were to put a... Uh, a tube, like the, the because the volumes, at least even at this scale, are calculating so quickly. If we do a little radius here, pull that in, make it thinner, thicker, slice, turn that on, and then also put this in, then that should create that intersection. Pull this down. Okay, don't want to pull too far because you see those automatically blob into each other. Um, I guess I'll pull that down and then move the entire eyeball down. It looks a little angry now. There we go. Um, don't want to be so angry. There we go. Look, he's happy. And then you can make him skeptical. And if you put a couple, and now he's worried. Um, yeah, uh, a couple, a couple controls and rigs on here, and it would be pretty. I think you could do some pretty fun things just by moving these around. Um, 
and uh, like a couple controls and sliders building a rig out of this this would be weird and cool and then even like uh, i kind of like the low poly nature of it we could go and put some smoothing on there and of course you grab your volume builders and decrease it so that these would become a lot more detailed and then if you want to kick yourself in the butt you can put a smoothing in there and it's going to smooth it all out it's going to look a lot smoother um but of course it's going to be killing you on the uh, refresh rate so you can see that this is a lot slower now um but there's something, there's something here. There's something cute here. I like it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd be curious what you guys think about that one. It's weird. Um, but let's save this as a weird little guy number B. Uh, let's see. You want to try and squeeze one last question in? Uh, time to do the quick shout outs. Uh, get your last question in there. We'll see which one we will tackle. Uh, I'm going to pop up here and say thank you so much, everybody, for coming and hanging out. Uh, I couldn't do this without all the questions that you're answering. Uh, I'm going to try and get my uh, number over to a couple of the other mods at the on Rocket Lasso so that if something happens, I can get a text that, so that it's not there. Um, so that, uh, like, Crossfader was kind of the person doing that for years, and now he's busy around the time that we're doing the stream. Um, but just to make sure that that can all work really well. Um, now I want to do a big shout out to everybody who is currently supporting on Patreon. It's a really big help making it so that I can do these live streams and so that, uh, we can make some really cool tutorials and there's one on the way I'm really excited about. Um, I don't really want to give any hints until I've got it locked in, but it's coming. Um, and then tomorrow is the bonus stream. So anybody who is at the uh, technician tier, um, is going to be able to participate in that where we do cool longer form projects. It's really cool. Uh, it's just really helpful. I also wanted to go and do a really big specific shout out to a Patreon supporter. I don't even know if they're hanging out, but I even made a special little screen here. We've got our first Among the Stars uh, follower on Patreon, and it's uh, The Great Wanderer Productions, I think out of Berlin. They got really great work on their website. Um, but uh, that's a, a, a big help. They're uh, the biggest supporter so far. I really, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, but I want to go and get at least one more question in here if anybody's hanging out. Um, so let's see. I am checking out the chat one more time. And what do we got? Um, let's see. Second one. People chatting with each other. Uh, actually, Crossfader's got one. Let's check that one out. Switch the screen over. And let's click on uh, this Behance gallery. It is the Fabric Font Mockup. Whoa, fabric font mock-up. That is definitely what it is. Uh, it is uh, GK Creative. GK Creative in the London, UK seems to be who put this together. Um, so these are like quilts. These are like a big sections of fabric. And there's all these really, really great wrinkles. Hmm. What do we do with these? I mean, we could drop. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, the, the, these always go to three things. It goes to doing soft bodies, cloth simulations, and sculpting. Like it's, it always ends up being those same three questions. If you're going to start getting these kind of detailed cloth. Having said that, like what might actually be better would be something like playing with Marvelous Designer. Like I, I keep hearing about Marvelous Designer, about some of the great things it can do, and if, especially if you're doing something with a still. Like it's absolutely incredible the stuff it can put together and the way it will pinch different, uh, different things uh, and, and just create overlaps and, and really nice materials. So uh, that's where I think that that would work. I think my chat died over here. So I'm going to click over onto my window here and make sure this is still going. Um, oh, yeah, the, the chat's still going here. So sorry, I had to scroll through the links. Um, uh, in fact, I'm going to try some of the other links um, because this one is its just really heavy duty. Honestly, it would just be inflating something a little bit and then dropping, dropping a rigid body on a soft body and then manually modeling in wrinkles and... That's going to be a really detailed, tedious one, so it wouldn't be good for a rapid fire, especially not with us already being over time. Um, let's see what we've got. Um, a couple people are asking about this one. Um, um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, be Havna is uh, or Havana, be Havana, be Havana, be Havana. I think it's be Havana. They're saying it must be an animation, not a still, which I appreciate your enthusiasm and your faith in me, but I'm not sure that that's a good use of uh, good use of our time there. Uh, oh, and I was saying uh, salt, but it's more uh, saik, saik, saikal, saika, or saikal. I'm not sure. Uh, if you want to type in a phonetic pronunciation, in the other window I had, you, the I looked like an L. Apologies for that. Um, like, we've done these kind of clop things before, and they always end up being really tedious. Um, but if a couple people are really enthusiastic about it, we can try and do a very quick version of it. I'm just not super confident we're going to get something crazy sexy here because you just need so many dang subdivisions on things. Like, I'm feeling like we need, like, this many subdivisions. Um, so if we were to do something like that and then make a floor because we need to be able to crash into something, let's go ahead and add a soft body tag to both of these. And honestly, soft bodies are the one that doesn't do that good of a job on them. Um... Like, the cloth is the one that does a really good overlap, but cloth does, it, it like, intersects itself. But what I would do here, first of all, it's soft body. Let's go ahead and add on a little bit of pressure. So I'm going to add in, I don't know, 15%. And let's see what our playback speed is looking like. And, oh, I shouldn't hit play. Um, so, yeah, that's doing a fine job of inflating like a nice pillow. Actually, it's a very nice pillow shape, but um, I would want the structure to be stronger. We allow it to bend and shear with the flexion and the damping. Let me make sure I have the right screen up. Okay, I do. Cool. Um, yeah, we want those to be up and then uh, ba, ba, ba. let's see. Now it shouldn't explode nearly as much, hopefully. So yeah, that's going to start inflating. And now we need a letter so let's go and make a mo text because it saves us a couple of objects. And we'll just make a nice R. And let's make it a Futura R because it's the official font of Rocket Lasso. Let's get one that's a little more even. There we go. That's a nice looking one. Uh, I want this to run really quick. So let's set this to subdivided. Uh, 90 degrees on the angle. And let's increase our minimum length. So we're going to go nice and low poly on this thing. Let's go and tilt it over 90 degrees. And there we go. Now it's ready to go floop and get a nice little nap. Let's save it. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. Uh, text out of cloth. <sighs> Okay, let's right click and add a simulation rigid body. Uh, shape is moving mesh. Okay, that should in theory be all we need to do. Scoot it over a little bit and let's very carefully frame by frame forward as everything does its thing. Um, okay, so there's even the basics. Um, it's inflating and that's pushing down. Actually, it's sort of exploding a little bit. So let's do fewer frames. So it's kind of inflating up. Two frames in, seemed okay. Let's hide the visibility of the text. And already you can see that we've got some limitations here. It looks really pinchy and kind of, I don't, I'm not even sure what's going on there, honestly. Uh, let's go ahead and drop our bounce and friction all the way down. Try a couple more frames. And yeah, look how it's, uh, it's really having a lot of trouble with that surface. I know it's an end gone, but. Um, that's real ugly. Um, now let's go in on our text and make sure it's subdivided. So I'm going to go to caps and let's change it off of Ngon. So we'll do quads. Should give it something to work with. Um, and then honestly, maybe we'll do a couple extra subdivisions because that wasn't running too slow. So we'll do that. So it's a little bit more even. All right. And let's uh, add on a display tag and we'll activate use and we'll say lines so we can actually see through it without... Um, Going too crazy. Say, so, yeah, look, see, these are like passing right through the surface. That's not uh, that's not great. Uh, let's make sure it's being treated as a volume. So we'll go to caps and say create single object. 
And let's do it again. That's actually making a significant difference now that thinks it's a volume, it's not just passing through a surface. So you can see now we're getting an indentation of the text, which is something. Man, that pressure is uh, more than I thought it would be. Wait, there is no pressure. Oh, wait, that's not the right object. Um, pressure 15. I didn't think 15 was that high. Um, so yeah, let's let that stretch and flop. Now even here, it's like, okay, now it's, the pressure is counteracting it quite a bit, but I think I'd want to make that text a lot heavier. So we can go into mass, and I'm going to change it to a custom density instead of world density, and let's make it eh, five times heavier. And do it again. And it should just make it so that it's going to be way harder for the cloth to push up on it, which means we should get a deeper indentation. Here you can see it's pushing it down a lot more. So, I mean, this is, it's almost like, okay, cool. That's as far as we can take it. And as far as cloth is concerned, as you can see, we get this nice indentation. We have to make this editable and start sculpting. Um, as is where I'd have to go with cinema at that this stage. Um, we're going to leave that one there. Um, and uh, for that bit of technique, uh, I want to see if we can get cloth to do anything a little bit better. Um, it's going to be a little weirder too. But let's go ahead and delete our soft body off of there. And we're going to delete our, I don't know if we need to delete our dynamics tag off of it or not. But we do need to turn this into a simulation cloth collider tag. And let's get rid of our bounce and friction. And now let's go to our cube, which unfortunately needs to be made editable. And let's add cloth on there. Now, one of the interesting simulation cloth. Something interesting is that cloth doesn't have, um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, cloth doesn't have intersection turned on by default. Cloth just kind of is cloth. Now there is no inflation. There is self repulsion. This is just going to flop on the ground, isn't it? Yeah. Um, how do you inflate cloth or people are constantly increasing the, uh, the size as a way of getting it to uh, eat up. That's like a very popular technique in the last year is like telling the entire object to get bigger. And then you can actually get some nice wrinkles out of it, which is pretty cool. Um, the problem is that we need a lot of stiffness out of this thing. Um, and you can only do that through iterations. Um, so yeah, you can see that that is just flumping out of uh, control there. And if our layer falls in, it's already going to just collapse in on itself. And we could tell, we can go to dresser and dress a bunch of the points. So let's go and do a, uh, what's the easiest way to grab the selection? Oh, uh, I guess we can try, yeah, there. I can just do that and I can say, fix those points. So I just can't fall away, but now you see this whole thing's going to fall down. I guess we could invert gravity. I think it has its own personal gravity, of course, because these are unrelated dynamic systems. Um, so let's go and give it a positive 9. I guess 10 is closer to it. Um, and now it should go upward, so at least that's something. So, okay, that's working fine. Now I'm going to turn off the dynamics tag on this rectangle. I thought it'd be kind of, or on the text. I thought it'd be kind of fun if it falls in, but it's clearly causing problems. So I can hit play. Now you can see it's inflating upward. Whoa, I don't know what that was, but... So now you can see that's uh, inflating. Uh, Gravity is going up. It's pushing it up. So as that goes in, um, let's go and try and chill out a couple of the parameters. Let's go and do less iterations. We've got our rubberiness and our flexion. Uh, I, I, flexion can go low. Flexion is how much it can bend. I want it to be able to bend quite a bit, actually, so it can kind of go up inside these crevices. Um, gravity is crazy strong on those edges. Um, oh, do you know what that is? It's the entire thing turning inside out, which is absurd. We actually don't need the bottom side of this, which is funny. But, yeah, let's get rid of it. Um, we've got this outer loop. I can hold down Shift and do a UF selection on the top. Grow my selection. Uh, UI, delete. There we go. Now we've just got that. I'm not sure if our fixed points are still fixed. So I'm going to click on Show. It looks like they're not. I'm going to select all, shrink, invert. So let's do that again. So that's Control or Command A, shrink, UK, invert, UI, and now I've got the outside. Fix those points. And now this should calculate faster. As you can see, it's all blowing upward because gravity is going up. 
that's fine. Um, forces, I think maybe some sort of uh, friction would be good. I'm not sure what one that would be. I go oh, drag. We got drag, which is nice. So let's go 15% on the drag because we don't need these going out of control. So there we go. That stuff goes up. Still gets a little twitchy over there, which is interesting. Um, I wonder if that's deflection. Ooh, definitely, definitely is deflection. Yeah, increase deflection that chills out instantly. Uh, bounce, friction, those are non variables here. Um, stiffness, I, we can probably even go easier on the stiffness so that this can like inflate up inside the inside more. And now, I mean, the, the thing that could get interesting is if we let it inflate or get bigger, like get the size going larger. But I mean, it's still giving us a nice text outline, but it's not, it's not that different than what we were getting before. Now those are, it's colliding with this. Potentially we could, I'm not even sure. Uh, at the time of zero, we can grab this text and move it down. So it's right there. Potentially we could keyframe something. So it's gonna like force these shapes in more. These are they're a really nice job of like shooting up inside there, but then it relaxed itself. I think it's actually getting pulled out from the outside, which is actually a little, that's a little bizarre. I guess it's not bizarre. What's happening is we get this nice amount of cloth going on in there, but then this one starts having heavier friction and starts pulling that inside out. So I wonder if, um, let's even, this is weird, but let's go to our dresser and I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna rewind this one. Let's save it and now let's save it immediately again as the next one, which is gonna be C. And now let's hit play and let that go a couple frames in. And now it's kind of nice. It's all filling in these gaps and there's some wrinkles going. And I'm going to tell that to be the dress state. And I think that means that that's how we start out. So the, the oh, no, apparently not. Um, well, I'm glad I saved because hitting, oh, initial. I should have set the initial. initial. So I don't know what I just did. I'm going to revert to saved. Thank goodness I just saved it. And now let's go forward a few frames. Up, up, up. Yeah, I like that one. We go here, initial state set. Now that's where we start. Rewind, we can continue from that point. Um, and now, it, yeah, it does an okay job there. But now that that's our initial state, I wonder if we can continue to inflate some more. So if we were to say 135, and we can't give it too many frames because it's gonna get out of control. And we'd probably need more subdivisions, but you can see we can inflate these more. And yeah, we can get more wrinkles going. So that's starting to become a little bit visually interesting um, as far as like letting these things overlap just by inflating those. So if I, again, set that as the initial state, create a subdivision surface, throw it inside, then now we're gonna get this subdivide. And now you see, we do get some nice wrinkles going. So that's where cloth, this is where cloth has the advantage over soft bodies. The soft bodies do not give you wrinkles. Um, um, let's see. Yeah, so that's working. I mean, honestly, this is not bad. This is more than I thought we'd be able to do. So you can see we've got our text. It's overlapping. It's doing a fine job. We'd want to do some smoothing probably because you see we get some intersections. Cloth is not good at fixing those intersections. Um, if we made it edible, we could fix those pretty well. Um, so yeah, that's actually not bad. These wrinkles are okay. If we were to pop open sculpting now, we have a good basis in which to start smoothing and creating different wrinkles and different areas on that. So you know what? That's not bad. This is better than I thought we would do. We got a nice letter R kind of all fluffy in there by constantly creating more cloth and allowing that cloth to fill up the area. Now I am curious. Uh, Hadley just said that he's just tinkering with XP cloth and that got him to this point. Let me tear off the tab. So he just made this with XP cloth. So XP cloth might uh, do some nice stuff as well. Um, that is gravity pushing down on it, which would be perfectly the inverse of what we did with it coming up. But yeah, it looks like XP cloth is doing a fine job. There's some cute little wrinkles in there. There's not all the bunching up that I think we'd want, but that's that's pretty cool. So nice, nice test over there on XP cloth. Not something I'm familiar with. And I don't want to spend time jumping into XP cloth right now when because uh, uh, that would just eat up a bunch of... Uh, bunch of that time um but yeah i guess just for fun just because this is looking all right why don't we uh give this a quick save as number d and i think i can just delete the cloth tag off and it's permanent now so yeah there's just the permanent one we pull it out of the subdivision tag and let's try and do a little hint of sculpting so i'm going to change my mode to sculpt pink pop that up and now we can subdivide 
subdivide. And now we've got that going. And now we can do things like grab our smoothing tool. And let's see if we can do things like fix. Yeah, see, we can fix these bad ones by doing little clicks until they straighten themselves out enough so they're not quite overlapping. So that by itself is actually doing a pretty good job of fixing these uh, essentially impossible pinches. We get those nice sharp ones, but we can get rid of the uh, overly extreme ones as much as we want to. Yeah, I'm actually quite happy with that. Um, pinch, pinch. Yeah, and that's just a very... Now, it, I mean, now the problem is uh, both the advantage and disadvantage is now it's a very manual process of using sculpting tools. So we could go and grab the uh, inflate. Might be do some fun stuff here where we can grab particular areas like that and grab certain areas and let them become more of a wrinkle. Um, but the, the main thing would be probably increasing the subdivision again and then doing things like, uh, I don't know what pinch is going to do. Yeah, okay, so pinch. And then if we hit NB, we can see we can start drawing in some additional little pinchy areas there. Um, pinch in various areas. But then grab the pull, probably. Yeah, the pull will push up and down. If I hold down control, it pushes down. Hold down shift as I click my middle mouse button as a button, and I can increase or decrease my radius, or I could click up and down and increase or decrease the pressure. So now by holding that control, I can push down. It's a little strong. Let's go easier on it. So yeah, we can start sculpting up. And let's turn on SSAO. It's not changing much, but yeah, we could start drawing in extra wrinkles. And honestly, I wouldn't even be too shy about like going decently overboard on these uh, as you as you go because it's really easy to grab the smoothing tool and erase them out. Um, I wonder if you can do combo tools because it'd be really great to have the uh, pull and pinch at the same time, like pinch it in while pushing it down. That'd be really cool. I don't think you can, but that would be neat. Repeat. And then there's the Amplify brush. That one's pretty cool. I think it just makes whatever it did do more of what it did. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. This, these pinches, like putting the Amplify in the pinch is really making them pop out. So, yeah. That, yeah. So, it just goes to, like, now artistically we have the ability to grab things like the smoothing tool and uh, increase. And, you know, it's like, okay, we need we want to calm this area down. Like, look how simple it is to calm that area down. Uh, this line still just bothering me. Get rid of that. This is too pinched. Get rid of that. So yeah, you can create areas of more interest or less by pushing this in and out. Um, and sculpting overall. Uh, I don't have any great answers on sculpting. It's just not something I do very often. But, oh yeah, and there's also the knife. The knife is, yeah, look at the knife. The knife is great. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can do, turn on like pen pressure here, right? Yeah, link pressure. So if we were using like a Wacom or a Cintiq, we could be having different pressure amounts. And that actually might go a really long way to like, you know, like doing thinner and smaller ones, like putting these in. Um, but yeah, oh man, this uh, this knife tool is awesome. I mean, it's not like actually cutting. It's just, it's almost, it is almost is like a push and a pinch at the same time. So we are drawing in our wrinkles really easily here. Yeah, and I, I don't. And yeah, too much power. So it's a little easier. Yeah, even less power. Undo a few of those, and then you could even do it multiple times so you can get longer ones. Pinch them out. Yeah, so it's really fun. And I mean, I think we've essentially done this before in the past. This one's looking better. Um, what does an anti pinch look like? Oh, neat. Look, you can create these really sharp ridges pinching out. So if I hold down, if we made this bigger and I pull this down, we get this really sharp pinch on there. So that's really nice. Man, this knife tool is suddenly like my favorite uh, sculpting tool. Yep. Yep. Pinchy, pinchy. Um... So yeah, um, yeah, sculpting. Uh, now, obviously, we just went way too far in a bunch of places, but a couple ticks with the smoothing, and it just cal you know calms those down, so you can see the transition happen into them. We always grab our amplify and 
make them a little bit more intense in certain areas. And, um, and yeah, we get some pretty nice, some pretty nice stuff there. So I think that will officially wrap this one up. We got a nice little rocket lasso R going. Uh, let's go ahead and give this a quick save for the final one. We're e, so it's text out of cloth. Sculpt. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm glad we spent a couple minutes on that one. The uh, it is surprising and fun, but simultaneously frustrating. Where like cloth is so old, but cloth does such a better job with this concept than. Soft bodies do, and soft bodies are better than cloth in like every way. So it's just crazy that you know that it worked better that way. Um, anyway, uh, is there any other final little questions or anything that anybody has before we officially wrap this episode up and we have we'll have completed another full Wednesday of Ask GSG? We're almost uh, yeah, we're at two and a half hours, so that's quite the uh, quite the thing. Um, do you know, sculpt tools fade over the link? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Salam is mentioning that you can turn it on so that the sculpt tools will fade out as you drag, which is a really good point. Like, I right there is making full strength tools, but you could make it so that you fade as you drag. Really, it would be turn on your Wacom or your Cintiq so you can actually get the pen pressure because then it's like the best of all worlds. The fade out is like a fake of that, but it's still pretty cool. But yeah, really good point. Um, and then Zalam is talking about doing uh, fake wrinkle textures procedurally. Um, the uh, let's go and pop up the screen there because it's worth seeing. Um, so you you're showing this, um, and then I'm wondering. Oh, so is this uh, the compression? Uh, the wrinkles. I'm assuming you did the wrinkles via. Um, well, yeah, you're saying you did noise. Sorry, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, you're saying you did noise in uh, a shader, but I'm assuming that you did on this, this kind of tech. Oh, I hate that Windows does that. Um, I'm assuming that you did something with the tension tag. So that you have the character tension tag and the tech character tension tag makes it so if you squish something, it will create a vertex tag where it got squished. And then you can use that vertex tab to tag to feed in some noise so that where it compressed, this happened. So you could potentially do the same thing here. In fact, I mean, um, it would be super insane, but we could take the original shape here and we could probably even just use a smooth tool and smooth it out, use the original shape and then morph into the new shape and the tension tag could be like, hey, here's where you compressed, here's where you expanded. Um, and then we could add additional effects based on that. Of course, noise doesn't follow the curvature of shapes like that, but it might stretch. So I don't know, there's potential there, but yeah, that's a, that's a really neat detail as well. So thanks for sharing that as well. Uh, I've lost my windows when I wiggled it. Um, yeah, the tension tag. Oh, you didn't use a tension tag. Uh, you just did yours based on proximity or a proximal maybe. Um, yeah, the vertex maps are the, uh, the way I would do that one. That's what I thought you were doing. Um, and yeah, the pose morph would be would be a really cool way of transitioning into that kind of thing. I mean, I don't, we could just keep going and going and going and talking about this forever. Um, but we could take this original shape, which is actually decently subdivided at this point. Um, it's not as insane as I thought. But we could go and smooth this out to a single flat shape and then morph between the two different ones. And we could even use like a, a morph deformer and use a fall off and transition into the wrinkles. You know what? That sounds too fun for us not to do. So we're going to do that, even though I was just doing the wrap up anyway, because uh, it should be really quick, actually. I know we might, might even be able to do the tension tag as an example as well. Um, we just saved. If I delete the sculpting tag, ooh, yeah, if we delete the sculpting tag, we lose it. So I want to bake that down. So let's just, uh, I don't forget how you bake it down. But if we throw that into a connect object, I know it'll work. So make that editable. Cool. We've got that baked down. And now I'm going to make a copy of it. And now this copy one, we don't need that. We don't need that. Um, this duplicate, duplicate rather, I think. Um, I just like clicking on sculpt because it pops the tools up quickly. Um, smoothing, smooth. I'm going to increase my radius and way increase my strength. Smooth. 
Smooth, 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 smooth. All right, we're going to be losing a lot of the, the overall stuff. I'm not that worried about it. I just kind of wanted to talk about this conceptually. So there we go. I'll just do that. And then honestly, I guess I'd probably select this and do we not have uh, coordinates? Coordinates. Zero on Y. A little more smoothing. Okay, cool. So that one's all flattened out. So we can go back to standard. And it's a little small now, so we get T for scale. Scale it up until we're about the same size. Probably even pull it down because I want the bottom to be the thing so it's going to look like it's fluffing up. So um, I guess we'll just take that one, right click, add a character. Hmm. Pose morph. The pose morph is going to be based off of the points. And then we can go and delete that pose and drag in this as a pose. I'm going to say yes as a relative target, which I think means, yeah, it's linked there directly. So that means we're seeing this one object here. If we go to animate mode, we can pull the slider. And you can see we morph from one to the other. So right there already, pretty cool. Morph, 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 morph. Uh, but where it gets interesting is if we use the... Um, the morph deformer. So we put the morph deformer in there, I think. And I put in this morph tag. And then we've got this morph here. But now we've got a fall off we can use. So if I make a linear fall off, there we go. Look at how cool that is. So we go like that. And it's transitioning in that way automatically. So much cooler. We can pinch this in. And we can transition the whole thing. But if you want to start making it interesting, of course, then we keyframe it. So we're going to have this keyframed um, coordinates. Let's just record X. And we're going to play through, give us some time, maybe like that. So we're going to transition all the way over to here. And we'll keyframe that. So that should do a nice little yoop. Now, let's go ahead and rewind all the way. Let's try putting our tension tag on just, just to see if it's actually working. So it's a character tension tag. And let's say we fix the tension right now. And we'll make a fold map and a stretch map. And we'll have to change the amount. But we hit play. And we're in point mode, so we don't see anything. But as the stretch is up, we can click on this tag. And this is where it's stretched. And then here's where it compressed. But we have to go to our tension tag and calibrate it. So I'm going to lock that one. No, that's not true. I'm going to lock that one as I click on the tag. And I need to keep on increasing this amount until we get kind of a nice full range here because that's where it's actually transitioning. Um, and then now this one, yeah, this one is less so. Those are very few places actually shrunk. So those are the only shrinking places. So I'm going to leave it on that stretched out one. So this does give you like this map where we have stretched out. And we have these details of where it got stretchy. And the edges obviously are the stretchiest part. But these other ones did. So we could add noises there potentially so that it would stretch more based on those. Um, or we could use that as a way of putting texture in a certain areas. Um, I just wanted to mention that as a detail. Um, and then, of course, if we want to go real fun, then we make a jiggle deformer. And we jiggle after the morph. And let's just see what it does by default. So as this passes through, and yeah, see these awesome overlaps that we're getting. Now it's heavily subdivided, so you can see the jiggle is a little, little, little confused maybe um, on what to do. Go to Object tab. I'm going to say uh, we can go easy on the drag, easy on the stiffness maybe. Yeah, it gets a little nuts. Yeah, that wrinkling effect is uh, intense. Um, I'd probably probably also put a smoothing on, especially there. So yeah, as the jiggle is giving us these overlaps, it's going to chill those out. Potentially, that could also use some sort of fall off. You can see we get these extra effects going. Um, and there's there's you know there's so many things that the uh, jiggle could potentially do on top of it. Um, killing the stiffness and increasing the structure. Every time we change any one of these sliders, we're going to get a significantly different effect. I, oh, man, let's see. Look at these insane wrinkles. Um, and so I did like the smoothing, chilling it out, but we don't want to lose too much of the effects. So how much can we uh, 
Yeah, I don't want it. Yes, I, I don't want that much, but maybe like that, where it's like really kind of wrinkling up, like some sort of inflating cloth. Uh, now there is some overlap happening in a couple spots, but that's pretty cool. Where uh, these are all flopping up, and that's just the uh, that's just the jiggle deformer like working overtime to make some really neat effects. So pretty cool. Um, even that, there's so many things where you could like push things further. The um, the uh, you guys have me on a roll here. This is always dangerous. Um, and now we're adding, getting to to uh, number six F on this one. Sculpt. Uh, morph just keep adding more words on here um we could add in the morph we could we could exacerbate the morphing we could make it more extreme so uh in fact i'm gonna make it into a new file just to see it so you can see we've got this this fabric here and what we could do is go into our we could make a duplicate of that and then sculpt again um sculpt brushes Sculpt brushes there. Okay, um, so if we were to grab the smooth, then what we could do is increase the smooth and then start smoothing these wrinkles a little bit. So I'm not going overboard. I'm not trying to smooth everything out. I'm just kind of smoothing these wrinkles a little bit. You see how everything got smoothed? So now that I did that, if I were to uh, hide our new unwrinkled one. No, that's not true. I want the unwrinkled one. So we've got the unwrinkled one. So this one is, you know, cleaned up. If we had the character tag morph, and now we drag, or yeah, morph points, and then I'm going to drag in this one, and now it's in as a relative reference. Now you can see that we are animating up to the, the wrinkled state, but now we've got essentially a calculation of the difference between the two. So first of all, we could go negative. So you can see I actually reverse the wrinkles. So now we've got like a completely, this is like the wrinkles, but opposite, which is also pretty cool looking. You can see it's a different kind of pinching going on everywhere. Um, so a little bit of smoothing there, but a completely different look that we just kind of got for free. Um, but then of course we can push up to 100, but we can go beyond 100. So we can start pushing that even further. So now every wrinkle is getting more extreme as well. Of course, there's limitations. It wouldn't be very long until a lot of these are running into each other. But it's just kind of fun to note that we could do do that. Like if you're going to add in the wrinkles, we could keyframe some overlaps. So you know we could you know if you know, it's almost like a natural kind of uh, of animation we could do where I could keyframe here and then hit play and right around now. We essentially get to 100%. Um, yeah, you know, we get to 100% and record again, but then we can play a little bit more and then overshoot quite a bit and then go forward and then undershoot. And it's almost like we can get that little oscillating uh, wrinkle effect going. So, yeah, and then chill it, eventually chill it out 100. This might look terrible, but. Um, yeah, you can see we inflate and then, yeah, you see, we get that little bit of a wiggle on the end. I didn't, I didn't smooth these out as much as I should have. Like all of these should be spread out more. Um, and then getting, but I mean, it's almost like that's almost what the jiggle is doing for us for free. Um, so that, that part might be redundant, but I do like those negative wrinkles. That is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, uh, the morph tag, if you think of the morph as a way of extracting, differences between models it actually makes it so you could there's a lot of cool possibilities just inside of that context um but this uh behind that one this is pretty cool and weird and crazy um Yeah, I like it. Uh, I like it. All right, guys and gals. I think it is officially to... Uh, <laughs> Jake says EJ gets a nickel every time I use a jiggle deformer. You don't make up the rules. Well, if that's true, there's a lot of things that I did that no one else is allowed to do. I'll, t I'll take that deal any day. If I'm the first one to have introduced something, I'll take that deal. No one else can use that unless I get a nickel. Um uh, yeah, so that was super fun. We got to tackle a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, really fun questions. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, hopefully next week we can 
Uh, I'll have my, uh, I'll be able to get a message more quickly if there's a problem of some sort. Um, you can, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks everybody who made it all the way through. Uh, I'll see everybody for the bonus live stream tomorrow. If you're in the technician channel and, uh, thanks everybody for supporting a Patreon, all that good stuff. And, uh, that should wrap this one up. So I will see everybody next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. I gotta pop the window up. The window up. Here we go. Here we go. Click the button. Bye bye.